are listening to episode 83 of My Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. Today, this is a very exciting show. I have with me Mr. Morley Robbins, a regular guest, and a new guest, Jim Stevenson Jr. And Jim actually heads up a Facebook group called Secosteroid Hormone D. And in that group, a lot of really awesome information is shared about vitamin D that's actually a hormone and the truth about supplementing vitamin D. Now, this is a very heated topic for some reason, I guess because people have their supplements that they believe are safe. And when you challenge that and say, hey, maybe your omega-3 supplement is killing you, your cod liver oil, your algae oil, your fish oil is killing you, maybe that iron supplement, that zinc supplement is harming your health, throwing you out of balance, uh, that iodine supplement, on and on. People are just taking tons of isolated nutrients, and you better know what you're doing if you're taking isolated nutrients. It's not bad, but certain ones like AA, ascorbic acid, are very bad because you're actually depleting copper, one of the most important minerals in the human body. So with vitamin slash hormone D, it's really interesting because similarly to iron and magnesium, the tests are worthless. And Jim goes into the reasons why that is. The main thing is that they're actually measuring 25-hydroxy vitamin D, referred to as 25-OHD. But that's not even the biological active form. The active form is called 1, 25, parentheses, OH, and parentheses, 2D. So it gets very complex, (laughs) as Jim will point out. My mind was blown. Most of this information is brand new to me. And we really need someone like Jim that's just constantly researching it to really put the puzzle pieces together. And I'll put some resources below in the show notes where you can dive in a little more. Uh, There's a huge 26-page PDF that breaks it down about what hormone D is and why you don't want to supplement it. I'll post a video called Not a Vitamin below. It's a short six-minute video. And I'll also post the Secosteroid Hormone D Facebook group if you want to dive in and learn more about hormone D. So let's just jump into it. These two guys are geniuses, and I'm really honored to have them on the podcast. So enjoy. All right, we're here with Morley Robbins and Jim Stevenson Jr. Welcome to the show, guys. It's great to be here. Good to be here. Yeah, this this is my first uh, uh, three-way call on My Life Radio, and... Uh, we're going to be focusing on vitamin slash hormone D, which is a very emotionally charged topic because I think most people are supplementing that and we've been taught for so long to supplement it and that we uh, should take, you know, especially with this quote unquote pandemic that we should take just insane levels of uh, vitamin D supplementation for our immune system. And so there's uh, multiple <laughs> kind of avenues for this discussion, talking about the immune system and um, what vitamin D can do. I actually just made a post today about how vitamin D is found, it's an active ingredient in in rat poison. Uh, the brand is Kintox, but there's other ones, mm-hmm. rat and mouse bait, and it's 0.075% poly, uh, polycalciferol. It's a hard word to say. <laughs> Three times real fast. <laughs> right. right. I try to stick with the abbreviations. It just makes it easier. And then I don't have to worry about pronouncing it wrong. (laughs) Yeah. So Morley, you said you've been aware of that for a long time, right? 
Yeah, it was actually one of the first things. I don't know how it happened to, happened upon it, but I was like, they're putting it in rat poison, but they want us to supplement with it. It just it made no sense to me, and because I was really steeped in uh, magnesium back in the day, uh, I very quickly learned that the you know the enzyme to make the storage hormone required magnesium in the liver, and then of course it goes on to make it. Uh, active in the kidney, and then I think um, one of the probably one of the most important articles I've ever read was by Meg Mangan, and I, Tim, I think actually you were probably one of the first people who encouraged me to read that, and um, just the whole idea of extra renal outside of the kidney uh, activation of um, hormone D was that was fascinating to learn about, but it's just it I think it's likely the most overrated and un misunderstood um, nutrient on the planet. That's just my, my personal opinion now, 10, 11 years into the uh, process. Awesome. Uh, Jim, anything to add to that? The rat poison thing, it is very interesting. And I always talk about it being the exact same physical act that we see as osteoporosis because that's oh, wow. really what we're doing to those rodents. We're, what we're doing is we're giving them a dose of vitamin D that exceeds the oral inputs or the oral available calcium at the time. So there's no choice but to take it from bone. And so oh, wow. a lot of people that are taking vitamin D are inducing that condition in themselves just by timing alone. <laughs> wow. That is, that is so fascinating to think about. I guess one of the questions that I have related to that is, you know, we're, we're stumbling over this term hormone D. We're all hip and we get get what it is. But when did it, when did it become a vitamin? If if the scientists who studied studied it really understood its properties, which I'm sure they did, why was it not called a hormone? Why was it why was the default to call it a vitamin? Do you have any insight on that, Jim? I do. This was all happening in the late 20s and early 30s, and it was first called a vitamin, and they were looking at D3. I think at first they accidentally looked at D2 for a little while and later sorted that out, but that was when it was found, but that was D3. It wasn't until, I believe, the early 70s when DeLuca and Hollick found 25D and 125D. Um, so much, much later. And that's when they started sorting things out a little better. So was this Hopkins that was doing the early research back in the 20s? No, was... that that would have been Madison. Oh Matt, oh okay, right. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Fascinating. I didn't know. So DeLuca and Hollick were th are th were they working together at one point? I think I think that was their joint venture. I think both their names oh. are on those papers. Um, I always, I always refer to DeLuca as the godfather of vitamin D. And if you listen to him, you get an entirely different take. Vitamin D is for people that crucially need it, that have a defect. And that's really about the only thing he talks to. Yeah, what's interesting about that, and I think I made this point um, and now I'm going to confuse whether it was to Matt or to, to you, Jim. I apologize. But I think it might have been to you, Jim. It was when I think about University of Wisconsin and Madison was this, this epicenter for retinol research for decades and decades and decades. And now DeLuca has completely reoriented the, the focus to vitamin D. And I, I don't know. It's I think a lot of the early research that was done in the 20s and 30s and maybe even into the 40s has been uh, kind of lost to the ages, which is unfortunate because they did some amazing studies of animal nutrition, plant nutrition, and human nutrition. It's really amazing powerhouse of uh, scientists there. I do agree with you there. And they are one of the places that finally allowed um, the scientists to patent and benefit in the patents. I only recently learned that. And it's also interesting that um, in that same area, we saw the Sunshine Beer come out in about the same years that they discovered vitamin D. And 
Hector DeLuca has always been honest. He he came out and said that Madison withheld publishing some papers until they had some patents in place so that they could benefit from the great promotion and the great science about what vitamin D was. That's wild. Well, one of my favorite factoids about Wisconsin is that in the 50s, it was against the law. You know, again, it's a big dairy state, huge dairy state. And it was against the law to cross the state line with margarine. <laughs> you would get you'd get arrested for that. And now I'm sure the state is dominated by canola oil and but a bunch of other stuff. Uh, it's just it's just insane how much it's changed in, in 70 years. Yeah, it has changed a lot. Yeah. So, so where where do you where do you hang out, Jim? What where's what part of the world do you hide in? <laughs> I live in Washington State. Okay. Right. I work at a hydroelectric dam. I'm a okay. considered an essential worker because people wanted a lot of power when they were locked in their homes. No kidding. So <laughs> we had to stay working. Um, I ended up doing this because I worked in fisheries for quite a while. I went to school, back to school, and got a teaching degree. And I got involved in studying juvenile salmonids on the outmigration in the main stem Columbia River, which is a big deal. And I did a lot of science with those folks, and we wrote a lot of papers for the county about the outmigration and their survival rates. We wrote official papers and studies, so I'm pretty good at handle on reading them and stuff. And I ended up, we ended up proving that the hydroelectric dams really aren't killing fish, and I ended up going to work there. But along the way, I learned how to research things pretty good, and it's yeah. my passion. I, I like knowledge. Oh my God. I, I, th I think that, let me just interject. I think Jim is one of the bright lights on Facebook and on mm -hmm. social media. Just, it was, it's, I was feeling kind of lonely. <laughs> and then Jim comes along. I was like, oh my God, this guy knows what he's talking about. This is so cool. But uh, yeah, it's just, there are, we need to clone people like Jim and, and Matt. It's just, we need more people like that. <laughs> It's just there aren't enough people who have that passion to learn and and to get down to the brass tacks of what's going on. So well, that's why this that. conversation is so much fun. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. oh my god. Yeah, and I didn't give a proper introduction to Jim Stevenson. I usually do it uh, separate to this recording, but he uh, he runs the Facebook group Seco Steroid Hormone D, which is a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. That's and what that, what does that problem. what does that actually mean, Jim? Seco that steroid. <laughs> That's actually what its true term is. It's It has one open carbon ring shy of being a true steroid. So it's oh. called a single steroid. And so that's its actual true term. Wow. That's very cool. I just I just learned today, this is kind of embarrassing to admit, uh, <clears throat> the steroid hormones are made in the mitochondria. I didn't know that. I yes. Like, wow. Yeah, I was like, Wow, is there is there anything that doesn't get made in the mitochondria? I think that's the that's the better question. Um, no, that was pretty fascinating. So that, would that mean that is the actual conversion of the precursor to the storage to the active? Is this happening in the mitochondria, Jim? It can happen pretty much anywhere that the tissue decides to let it happen, as long as there's a substrate there for it. And it can actually use some different substrates, but it all starts with the 7 dehydrocholesterol. And it turns out there's two pathways. There's one for internal. Um, it's an actual different approach to making the 7 dehydrocholesterol in the liver and in tissue. It's called the blotch pathway and, or block, B L O C H. And the yeah, other. Sure. In the skin, there's a different way that they arrive at the substrate. Um, so it's pretty interesting. And the vitamin D molecules and those molecules you're talking about, the sterols, they're, they're at the heart of steroidogenesis, really, um, all of them. The vitamin D2, we just are focused on one, right. one little leg of it. We're looking at a D3 to 2,5-D to 1,2,5-D pathway. That's just one, and I always say that's that's you're playing on the calcium side of the metabolism there, really. That's a repair pathway where your body 
is making very specific things that it wants in the tissues where the vitamin D arrives. You really have no control of what your body does with vitamin D. Even if you want to focus on 125D, it can make 5,000 suspected different, encode 5,000 different genes for creation of something. Uh, so it's what the, what the tissues and the cells there decide they want. It could be any number of white blood cell at once. You, you can't control that. And the, the body already decided for you because the, the DNA binding site on the VDR will have the right DNA go and bind there to tell it what to kick out. And that's internally driven. You have no say in any of that. I was talking with a client today who's, you know, trying to get back to balance. And I said, so did you take vitamin D? <laughs> he gets very quiet. <laughs> he said, yes. I said, all right. I mean, they, my clients no, I, I'm so, I'm so anti that they're just like, they're bracing themselves for the assault. I said, how much? He said, 10,000 I use. I went, uh-huh. I said, how long? He said, three months. <laughs> and I said, do you think that maybe that's part of why you're not in balance? <laughs> he laughed. So, I mean, I, I think what's, what's really hard, and I appreciate what, Matt, what you're doing with this conversation is there's so much, um, mythology around this. Oh, I've got a deficiency. I've got to restore it. And oh, I got to take high doses or whatever. And I think what, what Jim just said is mind blowing that we have no control over where it's going to go. There are apparently multiple pathways that it can go down. Nobody knows that. Nobody talks about that. I mean, I, Jim does on his website, of course, or his Facebook group, but it's like, this is a, a really dangerous, um, fact that it just isn't it isn't understood in the general public at least that i'm aware of and maybe matt you can comment on that but i'm just like i find that fascinating that we just don't know these basic uh pathways that in the different different directions that it can take yeah and what's what's scary too is that uh it's found in like i, I used to hang out in the supplement section of of sprouts and health food stores and just see what people bought and listen to the conversation between the 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 store clerk and the customer, you know, I'm looking for this. And then they take them to down the aisle and just vitamin D is in so many supplements, uh, whether it's a K2 supplement or a multi-mineral supplement, most people are on it and they just don't understand how much th that their supplement could be harming them. And whether it's ascorbic acid or zinc, there's so many of them that could throw the body out of balance. But I just wanted to kind of back up and give some context for the audience on the different forms um, for those that aren't familiar. So we have the storage form, which is the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And then the active form is the 125. Um, and then there's colate, col calciferol, which, which one is that? And how are the, can you guys kind of break it down just in summary or for the different ones? Like which one are people supplementing usually? People are typically taking the D3. Um, and I, I'm not going to lie. I actually don't ever really look at those names. I do D3, 25D, and 125D. So, but a lot of people end up taking D2. A lot of the prescriptions are D2. Hmm. And I think that that might have spared some harm, to be honest with you, but it, it's hard to say. But let's let's talk for just one second about D2 and D3 because they make a big deal out of it and it's going to get you into tracks that are wandering. There's, there are differences and, and that's just because one's a plant form and one's an animal form. They're going to have different affinities to receptors and to carriers. They're going to have different half-lives. And so whenever you find a 2,5-D test or a 1,2,5-D test that broke out the uh, factions of D2 and D3 for you, you almost always see a, a less than sign for the D2 component, and it's always a zero, almost always a zero. Um, the literature says that's because that's preferentially used first. Okay, so getting back to the taking of D2 or D3, if you take them and you read the literature, it doesn't stay D3 very long in the body. There's not a test for D3 in serum. 
But if you take super doses of D3, it will actually be truly stored in the body, not in serum, stored as the D3 analog. Um, there's papers on that. Then everybody gets concerned about 2,5-D deficiency because that's what they look at. But that's in serum. That would equate to being concerned about the fuel line in your car when you're driving and ignoring the fuel tank and not looking at that gauge because <laughs> science hasn't given us a true storage test. So is the car even running while you're looking at the fuel line? If it's not running, it's a whole different picture. But it's more confusing than that because step back to D3 for a second. In the sun, you make a sulfated version of D3, which is water soluble. That's never right. in a bottle. So you've got two D3s there. Then when you move to the 2,5-D level, there are 12 different 2,5-Ds. <laughs> and there's, there's, uh, there's the D3 uh, sulfated that moved forward and the unsulfated that moved forward. Um, and you have an epimerization pathway. I don't want to get too confusing there, but the study <laughs> showed that uh, by testing just those two forms, D2 and D3, the base ones that we've talked about, you, you miss the epiforms matter. And I'll tell you why. When you start giving children vitamin D, they start making the epimerization pathway form of 2,5-D. And it is low or no calcemic impact. There's a reason their body starts making it. It's probably to prevent calcification. That's just my theory right now, but it stands to reason. And when you look at these children, if they don't have the right test, up to 60% of their total 2,5-D will be in the epimerization form. And there are some tests that pick that up. I'm not gonna say there aren't any, but most of them don't. And they will still be considered low. And talking about low for a second, you have to keep in mind that somebody set the goal. It was a different goal before. Before 2010, they started fighting about this in 2008. They asked the Institutes of Medicine, New York Academy of Sciences, to review all the existing literature. The U.S. and Canada requested this. And they looked at, they did an exhaustive research on it, and they were... They were content with 12.5 as being the cutoff mm -hmm. for right. their mind was low. And most people would be fine at 10. But later that was changed through the Endocrine Society and, and Michael Hollick, who mm -hmm. um, right. he's at play there always. He runs the Vitamin D Society. I believe it's based in Canada. But he sells Fern D in a multi-level marketing type scheme down in the Philippines, which gets great UV. Um, so he's, he thinks all the dinosaurs died from osteoporosis. I really don't think there was probably time for that to happen. He's a psychiatrist, you know. And so is Canal at the Vitamin D Council, which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Matt, if we were smart, we'd stop this conversation right now because what Jim just shared would blow most people's minds about the different forms. That again, that's earth-shattering information for people. And I'm, I'm thinking of one of my favorite cartoons that I use in my presentations is people would rather believe a, a simple lie than the complex truth. And, and Jim has just given us the complex. Jim has given us the the, the superficial veneer of the complex truth. We, we have, I don't know. I, I'm looking for my seatbelt to, to understand what he's going to get into in, a, in about 20 <laughs> minutes. But it's just, it's, there's so much to this that I don't think the public understands. And I'm not sure they, whether they really want to understand. The, yeah, I, I think it's great, though, for, for people to understand the complexity of it, because you can't yeah. just take a vitamin D supplement and think that the body's going to do what it needs to, to do the right stuff and to support your health. It doesn't, it's not that simple. It's a little more complex than that. And we're not designed to get it through a pill anyway, right? It's either through the sun or dairy or. You know, all the, all the uh, classmates of mine, yeah, I was pre-med, you know, had designs of being a doctor. Ha, ha, ha. And, uh, but, but the classmates that, that actually got into medical school, they all got A's in calculus. 
These are people who are really good with math. They're really good with metrics. And they've been reduced to this, you know, grade school ruler. Oh, you're vitamin D deficient. No thought given to the metabolism or the mechanics of how does the body convert these different substrates into what we're measuring or and a complete denial about active, the 125, which I think is sinful. And it's just the the public has been trained, your number's low, and, and I think what Jim was getting into is that there's all sorts of controversy around that number. You know, I'm I'm from Baltimore, I worship at the altar of Hopkins, my nickname is Baltimorely, and Mohammed Amer did a study back in twenty thirteen and said there's no clinical benefit above 21, which is even higher than what and that was, you know, a few years after they'd done this exhaustive study. But this idea of 30 to 100, they they moved the bar up to this ridiculous level. And, and there's no consideration given to why is the body low? Why, why is your vitamin D at this level? Why isn't it at another level? No consideration to what Jim's talking about with the different pathways. No consideration about how do these enzymes work? What what are the what are the requirements to make these enzymes flip into the next level? I, I, there's just so many layers of of unknown, and the public just doesn't doesn't have that uh, level of understanding. That, that I think this conversation is going to help them open up their awareness. I think quite a bit. Absolutely. So with the tests, um, they measure the. They're measuring the 25, right? And Jim said there's 12 different 25s, <laughs> sulfated and unsulfated. <laughs> so there is it another case like with iron and uh, magnesium where they're looking in the wrong spot or they're looking at the wrong form kind of thing? I don't know that much about either one of those, but I do know that the red blood cell magnesium is definitely beneficial, whereas just the mm -hmm. simple serum isn't. And same thing's true of actual calcium too, because it's the ionized calcium that is the right. trigger switch in the hypercalcemia control axis. So simple calcium isn't it. It's not the one that's really driving any of the, the decisions being made at the cellular level. So Jim, if there are 12 different forms of 25, what, does, what is the lab measuring? I think, it's a fair, I think Matt's asking a really important question. What is the lab actually measuring, and how do we know there's consistency across the labs around the world? I don't think you can believe there's consistency in the labs because I even uh, Dr. Canal at the Vitamin D Council has published a lot of stuff on that, which he has his own interest in doing because he makes tests, but there have been a lot of problems in the past with the tests and with the supplements, to be honest. Um, where people have gotten mega doses of vitamin D in something um, that wasn't supposed to have anywhere near that in it. So that is always suspect. But they're checking the, the D2 and the D3 that um, is at that 2,5-D level, not the sulfated um, and not the epimerization forms because they're made in that pathway as well. And only in serum, of course, that's your check in serum. And here's, here's the problem with check in serum. We already said the fuel line analogy. Um, but what you have is in winter, there are, there are a few studies on liberation. I've never seen a study on utilization. That's what, there's no science of utilization. They don't even put uh, radiologic markers on vitamin D analogs anymore and track where they go and you, where they're stored. And they, they used to do that. We act like we're in the stone age now. You know, we aren't really tracking anything. And most people don't realize that it leaves in your fecal matter. They don't look for where it goes. They'll have you take 50,000, but they won't, they won't track it through you at all. They don't know where it goes. Um, so most of it is hopefully dumped. It's just, it's a gamble uh, that it's going to assimilate in you. If your body wants it, it would really already have it. Because in the winter, you can take people, there's a study on these men, where every day they liberate 3,000 to 5,000 IU of vitamin D. Now, keep in mind, if they had a test yesterday, that wasn't on it. 
all that they're going to liberate all next week and all through the winter is not on a test. It's coming out of true storage. And then people don't trust their own liver and they turn to the poor little codfish and take it from its liver as if they gave their liver up in winter. <laughs> so, so we have a flawed, we have a flawed range and then we have this complete unknown about the different forms. We have lack of consistency about how the labs are measuring. We have, we have no awareness of, of any consideration to the fact that the, the 25 hydrox, hydroxylase enzyme requires magnesium. The 125 hydroxylase requires magnesium. None of that is factored into this. It's just you're low in vitamin D. That's you're, <laughs> you're right. And actually, let's, let's talk about that for a second, because there's a group out there. I think it's called Grassroots Health. And they make a lot of charts. I want to be careful. There's another grass group that is spot on and understands vitamin D. But the ones that are doing all what I call fear porn and showing you the 2,5-D levels, especially now in COVID, and they email out newsletters to all kinds of people. That's why you see them all over Facebook. They get a newsletter from them. They're the source of the information. And that's a 2,5-D level, and they love to show it to you in the winter because it does have a seasonal variation. But they don't want to graph. We were talking about this earlier, Morgan. They don't want to show you the 125D levels ever. Have you ever seen a study with the 125D level being the demonstrated deficiency analog? Never, never. Those people have a defect in the parathyroid or the kidneys, and those people get 125D. It's that important. You don't give them D3. They can't make something with it. They can have all the 25D they wanted if they can't send it through the kidneys and activate it, and they'll die. They will die. And if you listen, that is a major focus of DeLuca, that 125D molecule. And I mentioned to you the other day, Morley, that he talks about how in other countries, osteoporosis is treated with 125D. He said nobody is willing to be that risky with medicine in the United States because we're a high calcium diet society. And patients would be dying. And as far as that grassroots group promoting that vitamin D deficiency, they're showing you that the people that are dying from COVID, the highest death rate is in the lowest 2,5-D. It would be really beneficial to science to know what their 125-D is because we know low 2,5-D is a marker and it's coupled in sick people with high 125-D once they're finally able to get a test. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And there are a lot of harms from that. So would, well, let's stay with that for just a minute, if I may. If the, if the low 25 is typically connected to high 125, is that because the body is using it as an antimicrobial peptide to fight some kind of infection? Or is there, are there other reasons why the body would would default to a higher active form? It will make that for the immune response. That is the molecule of immune response, and it has a diurnal rhythm and about an 8 to 12-hour half-life. And that's how they discourage people from testing it. Oh, it's got such a it's – it's the one that does the work. Of course you want to look at it. You don't <laughs> – you have to know what it is. That's the goal. That's the goal. All the bragging in the vitamin D Smurf language of vitamin D is important to the immune system. Vitamin D is important to this. Vitamin D is important to that. If you put the true molecule in there instead of vitamin D, they're saying 125D is this. 125D is that. Mm -hmm. Not 25D. It's a bait and switch. A lot mm -hmm. of people, I've learned that the MTHFR people, can get really confused by the three-step activation. They're focused on uh, folate to mm -hmm. methylfolate. Right. Methylfolate's the goal. So they see I take D3 and I'm getting a 2,5-D test, and they just assume it's the active form. And they oh don't my gosh. think that oh, they're wow. not there yet. So when you start telling them you need to test the active form, 
no one's low in that, they come back and counter and show you a bunch of two five D studies and try to tell them that's not the active form. And it's unfortunate in a group that's all about the failure to activate a molecule doesn't realize they're not even talking about the active sunshine molecule. Well, for a few years before the great Jim Stevenson Jr. made it onto Facebook, I was slogging this war. Uh, and I was, I was, there was a period and it still exists, but we would not let anyone comment on any topic around vitamin D until they presented their storage and active vitamin D tests. It was, it was, it was, <laughs> I think people on Facebook were absolutely repulsed by it, but, but they, they, they finally capitulated and we really began to, to reveal what Jim is talking about, which I think is very exciting that, you know, it's, the numbers were just so outrageous. P you know, people, first of all, people didn't have really low, they were in the twenties and, and low thirties. Well, that's not low. You know, again, compared to twelve point five, but the the active was sometimes it was four and five times higher than the storage. It was frightening. What what people people didn't know that there was even a an active form. It was an amazing uh, period where people got a little bit of schooling, and uh, I I very graciously yielded uh, when Jim came because it was just like because because he can talk circles around this stuff, but it was just like I was just trying to keep the the uh, the tide waters at bay with this people were going crazy. Say, what do you mean I can't take vitamin D? Why? It was wild. So I survived that. And, and I thank you, Jim, for for survey, for uh, rescuing me from that evil torture that I was faced with. Well, before that, I felt pretty alone. And some people started saying, oh, you're talking about that. You need to talk to Morley. <laughs> talk to Morley. And so that's how I ended up on your page. And what, what's left of Morley? <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about the activation of 125D. Mm -hmm. So, in a normal, non dysregulated system, that would be the goal. The body's going to make some 125D. And there's lots of people that are not messing with the system and functioning just fine. You know, healthy people that aren't having any issues. They're 125D. They probably don't even to check it, but it, it would you know, be what it should be because it's the molecule of immune response. That's why the range is 18 to 72. And keep in mind, it does have a gap. Unlike the 30 plus game we play with the other, with 2,5-D. And, and with that being said, 2,5-D, if you look at the all-cause mortality curves and you look at what's the level associated with the lowest mortality, the level of 2,5-D, you're going to find that it's in the low 20s right there where that Hopkins article is. There's no benefit in being over 21. It's right in that sweet spot. And we don't get over 60 naturally without pushing pills into the body. And you notice that there's an uptick in mortality above 56 on most of those curves, which stands to reason. Being low and high are both bad because it's what they call a reverse J-shaped curve. And then I know I'm wandering a little bit here, but let's get the one, two, five D I was talking about why people are making that. So if you have an infection like Epstein-Barr or any other kind of infection, but let's take Epstein-Barr, it makes an antigen called EBNA3. It makes several, and that's probably one of the ones if you took an Epstein-Barr test, be one they looked for. They'd look for antibodies to that. That... EBNA3 is capable of actually parking in the vitamin D receptor as the molecule that would displace 125D. It would take its parking spot. So, but it also is creating the 125D through the cytokine response of its antigen being in you. So there's a bunch of 125D being created without a home. And if you look at the affinity of it, to its own receptor and to the other nuclear receptors in its family, like the androgen and the thyroid, you'll see it already has a higher affinity to those other receptors, but its tight regulation keeps it out of there. The problem is when it can't get to the vitamin D receptor itself, it can't downregulate itself. And so it's being created unabated, and then it takes out your thyroid, and then it takes out any other system along the way, it depends on what tissues this is occurring in. 
but it will wreck your entire system if it can't get to the vitamin D receptors where it needs to go. And even the oldest human disease, leprosy, had a mechanism of blocking one of the calcilithidin antimicrobial peptides. So that's why they're still around today. They've blocked the chemical warriors that for their which there is no immunity. Amazing information. I've heard Morley, you, you talk about the, um, is it the RXR receptor, the retinoid receptor saying everyone talks about VDR, but no one talks about <laughs> RXR. Is there a relationship here with, with that? Yeah. And again, I think my um, understanding of this is pretty basic. I'm certainly going to yield to Jim to uh, smooth this out, but I think part of the ch the challenge is that, the we live in a world of mononutrients so people focus on like you were talking about earlier zinc or iron or vitamin d or whatever and none of none of these nutrients exist in isolation they're all in pairs at least in pairs there may be families but you know calcium and magnesium co copper and iron you know vitamin a and vitamin d and they exist in pairs in nature and I was surprised to learn that there was this RXR receptor, nuclear receptor, that's important, I think, for some components of vitamin D metabolism, and not all components, but it's particularly important, I know, for activating, or, and Jim, I'm sure you can explain it better than I can, but there's a component where the RXR has to be there for the uh, active D to have its fullest expression. Is that, is that a fair way of saying it, Jim? It, it is. So when it comes to the RXR and the VDR, they do something called heterodimerize. Right. Each, yeah. each one is a dimer by itself. So when they come together and they can, they can function alone, whichever retinoid is being used there can function on its own. And some of those other receptors, that's not the only retinoid receptor, but when 125D is doing what they call its classical job, which is the slow genomic response where it kicks out whatever you need, chemical or biological warriors, that's a very slow response that's done by the nuclear VDR. What happens is the vitamin D, the VDR, and the RXR come together and they go into the nucleus of the cell. Mm -hmm. Right. When that's happening, that's when 125D is working with the retinoid and the RXR. It works alone as well. It, there is another form of vitamin D receptor. It's called the membrane. It doesn't have to be inside the nuclear or in the nucleus of the cell. It doesn't have to join the RXR. This is called the rapid response and it can be seconds to minutes, and it uses other nutritional ligands as well besides 125D. It can use um, things like curcumin, rosemaric acids, things like that. Um, that's probably why some of those things have been so beneficial in Chinese medicine. Um, then one of the preferred molecules that that nuclear, or I'm sorry, that the membrane vitamin D receptor uses is a molecule called lumisterol. You may have never heard of it, but that's pretty much pre-vitamin D. When the body takes 7-dehydrocholesterol and starts to act upon it, it can make lumisterol and tachysterol. And then it also makes D3. The lumisterol and tachysterol can revert back to vitamin D3 without more sun for 72 hours. They're a reserve, but it turns out lumisterol, which is made at the same rate as D3, has a home. It's the membrane VDR. You don't even have lumisterol tests. There's several forms of lumisterol, in fact, I think four at least. <laughs> Matt, I'm trying to picture your average listener just like, <laughs> Bye. <laughs> it's definitely you cracked me up when the emails you said you said once the mthfr load <laughs> this is it <laughs> oh, that's right exactly oh my god so wow jim one thing that's fascinated me is that both both um retinol and its retinoids and um 
the, I guess the active form of vitamin D are able to um, influence and affect the immune system. And as I, as I understand it, they, they don't do it the same way. And, and please correct me if I'm, if I'm misinterpreting it. But my understanding is that the, um, the role of the vitamin D is to suppress the, the immune system. And the role of the retinoids is to downregulate. And, and is that a fair characterization? That I, the, way I, the way I describe it is that suppression is like spanking a child and locking in its room. And downregulating is a parent putting their forehead on the child's forehead and saying, let's calm down. We'll, we'll go home and sort this out. Very different approaches to changing behavior. But I know I've picked that up by reading an article um, a couple of years ago that was really a very deep dive into retinol and vitamin D, but love to get your perspective on that. You know, unfortunately, I don't really know enough about retinol or retinoids outside of the RXR pairing to okay. say, and that is, that's a very specific thing that's easy to stick with and not run into a bunch of another bunch of other retinoid influences that I've had to learn to still get my head around the vitamin D. But I would say even with the vitamin D, when you start talking about the immune response, sometimes it, it would stifle it. Sometimes it would boost it. I think that gets into the more complex discussions about whether you're having a TH1, a TH2, or a TH17 mm. response, that which is sense. super, super complicated. And sometimes vitamin D is at play with interleukin-6, sometimes it isn't. And those are super complex things that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm probably never going to understand myself. Yeah, no, I think that's well said. One thing, uh, the, the benefit of COVID-1984, if there was any benefit, is it, it forced me to learn about the immune system. I really took a deep dive in, and uh, I, studied, I studied malaria and I studied the immune system. Why did I study malaria? Because when, when uh, Trump talked about hydroxychloroquine, I knew that was a malaria drug. I'm like, this must be a parasite. So that, that took me down a real fascinating bunny trail. But the, the, uh, the whole dynamic of the immune system, you're talking about Th1, Th2, Th17, one thing I learned that's really important for the listeners is <clears throat> the T cells don't work without energy. They, these are really smart parts. The, the, the intelligence that these cells use to make their decisions requires energy. So if you don't have energy, it doesn't matter what kind of, of vitamins you're, and minerals you're taking, you better be able to have, crank up the mitochondria of those um, immune cells. So that, that was one of the most important things that I learned in the last 90 days because it just had no awareness that, that, they, that they needed energy, just assumed that they did their thing. I don't know. It was fascinating. That's awesome. That's so true. And um, I, I, I had a quick question about going back to the rat poison because this was the criticism I got uh, when I made that <laughs> post. Someone said, to have a 50% chance of killing a rat is 100,000 I use. And they said the equivalent in humans would be 4 million IUs in a single serving. Um, is it kind of like a slow kill with humans taking it? I mean, because you were saying, Jim, that it's stored, right? So I could see that causing like long-term downstream issues. It just keeps getting stored. Well, the storage itself would be probably the natural process that as long as you weren't doing anything crazy would be fine. If you had something, I've never read of this about this happening with vitamin D, but Vitamin A, you can have some liver issues. I think a form of hepatitis will cause you to dump all your vitamin A at once. So that would be when a storage get used against you. And there is a paper out there about vitamin D and it becoming a weapon against you, say, following bariatric surgery, when maybe you're really liberating a ton of it, then you might reach toxic levels that way. Um, but, but really not in that storage world per se. The, the rat poison, they always want to talk about the dose makes it, but the reason that it's so effective in the rats is because you're giving them so much they don't have any calcium to counter. Unfortunately, a lot of people will counter with the calcium at the same time and it'll be there. But what they're really doing is they're shuffling bone way too often. You don't need to 
shuffle that much bone. We increase calcium by fortification and vitamin D by fortification way beyond that of nature. And we were healthy long before we did that as a as homo sapien. So we had strong bones before we started obsessing about these things. And there was an osteoporosis expert that made the most sense. He said, why would we need to attain such high levels in blood of a molecule that's so hard to find? You turn dark to not make too much of it. It's limited in food sources. Who decided that you need so much of it? Was it maybe somebody selling it? Very, very good point. Good. <clears throat> Yeah, well, I remember as I got into this years ago, I was fascinated that the environment of our ancient ancestors was very, it was very calcium poor. And, you know, there, there, there are three hormones to man, manage calcium in our body, and which is really important to understand that. And a lot of people don't realize that, that magnesium is managing all three of those hormones and or magnesium status. And we we just have this very twisted view of the world now where there's a 7-Eleven every other block. Well, that's not what our ancestors grew up with. I mean, it was a very different environment, very different uh, macro and micronutrients. And we've lost all of that understanding in the modern era. And we've, we've adopted these uh, dictates, these dietary dictates that, that don't make sense in a historical context. I agree. Yes. And... Why didn't they end up focusing on magnesium per se? Was that because everybody would have the trots and it'd be so obvious you didn't need more? Um, <laughs> it's never, we do need it. We know we need yeah. it because it's not yeah. added for us. I think that's a pretty good sign. I think most of the things that are added for us are an outlet for a waste product or uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately can be harmful. Uh, the I see that with vitamin D, of course. You know, Jim, you made a comment a couple times now. I want to make sure I understand it. You're talking about with we're because Matt keeps raising these um, questions about the rat poison, and you're saying that that they don't have the calcium to meet the vitamin D. What, what exactly? Excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> what what exactly are you saying there? Okay, so when it comes to the body balancing the serum with mm -hmm. Vitamin D, vitamin D really sets the, the level in the calcium, or I'm sorry, in the serum. It will influence the PTH. It's right. a three-way thing. It's ionized calcium, PTH, and 1,2,5-D, which they never talk about. They, right. They, right. they talk about 2,5-D, but it's not the control, and they talk no. about calcium, regular calcium. It's not the control either. Those right. three are decades established the hypercalcemia control axis. If you want to stick with three variables, you can add a ton more. You could make that a six, seven, eight, nine axis. You could really complicate it. You could add phosphorus, you could add clothos, you could add a bunch of other stuff. But <laughs> in the simplest, in the simplest one, that one two five D sets the level. They're not measuring it. What is your one two five D level? Because that's going to dictate the serum level of calcium, not two five D. So that when you sense. have someone okay. low in two five D and they're saying, oh, look at this COVID person. They're going to croak because they're so low. They will have a 125D level probably higher. And their ionized calcium be the one that's being matched by that. They're not measuring that either. So when you raise that 125D level, however the body does it, you put in some D3 and Epstein-Barr or COVID's in there, taking it to the 125D level, then that determines what the calcium needs to be. Maybe there's calcium in the gut to match that and accommodate it right then. But if mm -hmm. there isn't, it's got to get it. It goes to bone and it strips oh, it from bone okay. then. Okay, that's that what sense. causes the osteoporosis because that's what rodenticide is. We're causing them to cause stones in their kidneys of calcium. Right. And it's got to come from somewhere. No, that makes sense. Okay, that makes perfect sense. It's funny too, on the warning of that, it says, uh, cal uh, notice to physician, if serum calcium levels are elevated, treatment with calcitonin is effective in reducing calcium to normal levels. And that's calcitonin is controlled by magnesium, right? Yeah, no, it's just that the level of understanding, I think it was Robert K. Rood was the, the, the uh, researcher that I read from USC Medical Center. He's a very talented 
endocrinologists that really studied um, the calcium side. And it's fascinating to see what connections can be made. I've, I've never heard of the, the fact that you could have multiple axes where you could have seven or eight or nine. That's that's mind blowing to think about. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling to keep up with PTH and, and uh, active. And it's, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. I want to ask you about ionized calcium. Like how does that happen? Because I've looked up studies because I'm just obsessed with milk and, and like goats and just milk in general. But I know milk has ionized calcium in it. Is it something that can be made in the body or ingested via milk and other things? Or? Morley, can you answer that? I, no, I, I was hoping you would. <laughs> Actually, I, I don't, I don't I, know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how the body decides to handle that ionized calcium right off of the top of my head. I'm sure it's in every one of those papers that I have about it. Um, mm -hmm. But let's talk about the calcium for a second. There was a gentleman, and this is really interesting. He taught where Dr. Canal from the vitamin D council went to school. He was his professor there. And I, I'm going to draw a blank on the name of the university, but that was his professor there. Later, that professor started praising the work of Dr. Canal at the vitamin D council. And he did say you can take insane levels. He kind of felt that. But he pointed out in his work, and he was one of those people that radio labeled vitamin D analogs and looked at where they went in the body. And he was very clear that calcium is this really small role. It's only one little piece of the system and that vitamin D is not just those molecules either. He had other frequencies of creation that he looked at. Sorry about that. Um, and he was aware that it was, he called it Soltrol, S-O-L-T-R-I-O-L, I believe, because it was solar forced created and it acted on what he the pineal gland and that was the control of the whole body was through the retina through that way and sorry about that i have these pop-ups i don't know if they're coming across in the recording um and he said that that was all ignored when they started looking at the calcium sensing receptors that once they needed to really have the rubber meet the road and prove this whole calcium side, because all along the way, they ignored any analogs that didn't have calcium as an impact that they created. Even DeLuca would ignore things that had zero calcium impact, and they would call them inert molecules and move beyond them. And so once they started looking at what which has calcium sensing receptors, they found that the, the vitamin D uh, the tissues that were served, the vitamin D target sites didn't all have the same calcium receptor sensing receptors. And they didn't always, uh, they weren't always involved in the calcium impacts. That it was the whole immune system that they were overlooking that we're talking about. Vitamin D is so much more than that because you make, when you go in the sun, you make at least 13 other molecules in a pathway that's called the CYP11A1 alternative molecule pathway. And those are the kind of molecules that he was alluding to that we make in the sun. They don't even go to the vitamin D receptors. They go to what's called the orphaned retinoid receptors or ROR's. And those are circadian rhythm control, glucose control, insulin control. They're a whole nother side of the equation, but they're made anytime you go in the sun. And that was the kind of things that he was researching. And his work was once all cited all over the vitamin D council, but without the archive system, you can't find any mention of him anymore in Dr. Canal's work, even though he was his professor and mentor. Hmm. Wow. Well, I know that I did a lot of um, ionized calcium testing years ago. I never found it to be a particularly helpful marker. People did not have strikingly low or high it always <clears throat> assuming that the reference range that they were offering up i think it was 5 to 5.5 that people were always within that range i don't think i ever had anyone below it or above it is there a reason for that jim is that or is that what you would expect to see in in um studies like that 
I think almost always people seem to have normal calcium levels and everything okay. I've seen. And I yeah. usually okay. would refer to your your rail system that you talked about with the calcium, magnesium, and the 2,5-D and the 1,2,5-D. Right. Now they ride right. on the rails. Yep. Oh, yes. Right. Exactly. No, it's just... It, um, and. And so with, with the perfect, if you really wanted to have a perfect test of someone's calcium status, you do the ionized calcium, the 125, and the parathyroid? Correct. PTH? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. PTH. Interesting. And I want to go back to the liber. I've never heard of the liberation of vitamin D in the winter. You mentioned, Jim, uh, quite a while back, 3,000 to yes. 500 IUs are liberated in the winter. So. Does that happen like in the absence, like in a few months, I'll have no ultraviolet light up here in North Idaho for like four or five months or so. Does that mean that my body is going to start pulling vitamin D out and I'll just, you just say urinate it out or, or just through the elimination channels? No, you're going to pull it out as you need it daily. And that's what the study showed that healthy men liberate 3000 to 5000 from storage they the study didn't know exactly which storage because there is actually a lot of storage from vitamin d forced vitamin d i should say it's stored in bone there's a recent study that came out that said it's stored in mass and muscle it's stored in tissue it's stored in cells it's stored in the kidney and it's stored in the liver and it's stored in fat it's stored in adipose tissue white and brown and actually the vitamin d receptor and gene controls which type of fat is made it's so integral to it oh wow. interesting okay good i've been recommending for oh sorry go ahead jim <laughs> i failed to answer the second part of that you mm -hmm. talked about urine uh, how it leaves the body i in that case i'm talking about excess inputs let's say i'm taking the ten thousand a day for three months like morley said you'd find most of that was was leaving and it and if you read about it it leaves in fecal matter so um there's just no test for that i've never heard anybody that said they got tested for that wow do you think there's a benefit to using like a ultraviolet light like i have a little spurty here um for sulfating cholesterol in the winter um because i usually push people to ultraviolet light whether it's synthetic or device or the sun because that process is natural um, do you think there's benefit to using like UV lights or in the winter? I do think there's benefit to light and I actually wouldn't limit it to UVB or UVA, or I'd just say there's benefit to light in general. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are doing reds, things like that. Some people I've heard are doing the traditional fire light because that's what we had and all we were exposed to for so long. But, um, this is what I would say about using uh, vitamin D light. And I have a 311 nanometer narrow band, which you can use in four minutes or less and make a ton of vitamin D without on compromising your folate. That's the delicate dance the body's doing. Anytime you're making vitamin D, you're degrading folate. And so that's why people turn dark. You need the folate to protect the fetus if you're potential mother, things like that. So that's the darkening of the skin is to protect other molecules that are photo liable as well. Um, but when you start talking about using light, I would probably only use it for people that could not get to the right light. And so somebody like you who maybe has a healthy lifestyle all year round, I don't think you would necessarily need to supplement with that. In fact, you could possibly start messing with your circadian rhythm. As I discovered those ROR molecules that I mentioned a minute ago, the CYP11A ones, they, through the retina, they actually, they know what time of year it is all the time. That's how those men in the study, I say men because that's who they studied. Those men in the study were liberating because the body knew it needed to, it might be based upon, I, you might supplement in the middle of the year, maybe if you stayed in the dark, but say people that work in a hydroelectric dam, like I work with that are inside all day, somebody like that. But if you're going to be on your days off and getting natural sun, I would try to limit the use of that light when it exists outside, just to not throw off the circadian rhythm. Because there's a lot to be said about the circadian rhythm. 
and metabolism, obesity, and, and everything. Um, so I, I'd use it with caution. I'd use it for people that maybe don't have access. But I still, to this point, really haven't seen a clinical uh, demonstration of somebody without a defect that was truly low. Um, in Trevor Marshall's work, they look at people that have XP. So it's a form of pigmentation or uh, they lack pigmentation. They're super light sensitive. Even those people practicing no sun exposure, they don't end up deficient in more 2,5-D. Um, nocturnal lamprey have a functional VDR. Um, so I think it's a little more complicated than we think. Those are great points. Yeah. I think for viruses too, like I've been studying like methylene blue plus light therapy is really effective for uh, human coronavirus. There's multiple human studies on that. And so like I've had books on ultraviolet light for you know virus, you know, antiviral kind of therapies and antibacterials, super effective for that. <laughs> well, yeah, light is fascinating in general. They rolled all those people out in the pandemic into the sun. We use it for TB, called them solariums. Mm -hmm. There's some great work about how hospitals were designed to hit everything with light, outside light. It wasn't considered sanitary unless the sunlight hit. And there's Florence Nightingale. Um, we know that light vibrates perpendicular to its path, so it can shatter things just like light does. I mean, just like sound does. Mm -hmm. My, my all-time favorite saying by Ray Pete: sunlight is what keeps copper from becoming iron. And that took me about three years to figure out. I th I've never had a chance to talk with him about, but I think what he's referring to is the the everyone keys in on, oh, sunlight activates the synthesis of vitamin D. Yeah, it does. But it also activates the breakdown of vitamin A. <clears throat> and you've got to have retinoic acid to load copper into ceruloplasm to regulate iron. And so that's what I think he was referring to as a very sophisticated way of saying, you got to have sunlight in order to have proper copper iron balance. I think it was, it was a fascinating way that he described it. That's really cool. Um, I wanted to ask too about vitamin K2 because I went down the rabbit hole of researching it um, and looking at osteocalcin and, and that relationship with vitamin D. And just every K2 supplement always has D with it. So I made my own without any hormone D, <laughs> the K27, K24. Um, does vitamin, it's is my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that vitamin D, taking D3 will increase your osteocalcin. And so therefore your requirements to carboxylate it or to activate it, which you need K2. So taking them together is kind of like defeating the purpose because all that K2 is going to be used to activate the osteocalcin from the D that you just took. Is that, does that make sense? <laughs> yes, it does. Actually, when you mentioned that this was something we might talk about, I brushed up on it a little bit and you can't brush up on that without looking at vitamin K because that's what you run into. But also keep in mind, you run into 125D being the molecule at play there. In fact, I have a paper open right here and, and you're right. It's all about the carboxylation of it. Um, and it, if, if I remember correctly, this article said it was a very particular, uh, form of the vitamin K. Um, I think you mentioned it a second ago. It sounds like, you know, quite a bit about K. Yeah. Menaquinone seven, there's multiple different mm -hmm. ones, but I think yeah, MK4, seven, MK7. yeah, mm -hmm. right. MK4 is pretty easy to get. Seven's like an aged cheese. So I try to eat that when I can, but it's hard to <laughs> find a recipe to use that. In. But, uh, yeah. This is what this says. Carboxylated osteocalcin promotes the incorporation of calcium into the bone matrix, thus supporting bone metabolism. The vitamin K dependent matrix GLA protein CMGP counteracts vascular calcification in age related wear and tear on the arteries and protects the blood vessels and calcium overload. Um, but that they don't, as everybody knows, they don't feel that anybody gets enough vitamin K to counteract that. And that gets back to that conversation we were having about vitamin D deficiency. Why is everything 2,5-D's fault? 
I don't, why does it need to be acid? It's, it would obviously be potentially vitamin A's fault since vitamin D in that pathway that they're striving to achieve doesn't happen without vitamin A. But why isn't it magnesium's fault? Why isn't it calcium's fault? Why isn't it K's? Why isn't it methylfolate? They set a goal. Anyone coming in under that goal, it's the cause of it. It's a condition in and of itself. Once they set the goal and they pin you under it, they say, well, look, here's your answer. You're vitamin D deficient. It's the answer to everything. It doesn't, none of the other molecules matter. They made a whole chart that says, wow, you'll avoid all these diseases just by getting your 2,5-D number above this. That's what you're sold every day with this deficiency. And all those studies, of course, are based on correlation and not causation. And that the people don't understand that. So we were held hostage for 65 years about cholesterol. Cholesterol causes heart disease, right? We all know that, right? right. And then, and then uh, Ravnikov and Diamond et al. in 2016 said, stop. It, it does, cholesterol does not cause heart disease. And they finally put that to rest. But what people don't seem to understand is that, well, what is vitamin D? What's well, a derivative of cholesterol? Right, and and all of those all of those studies demanding people stop eating cholesterol were based on correlation, not causation, and now we're back to son of cholesterol with vitamin D. It's a, it's the same argument, just a, a different metabolite, and the public doesn't know that. And I, unfortunately, I don't think it's taught in in doctor school anywhere. They just they're told what the number is, and they've got to manage to the number. Right. Don't don't, don't think about it. And you can't, uh, the whole cholesterol thing, you can't separate it from vitamin D because people constantly say cholesterol, vitamin D is made from cholesterol. It's not though, actually. Right, that's right. That's it's made right. from 7-dehydrocholesterol and yeah. so is cholesterol. There's only two carbons different. But the problem is that when you choose to take your vitamin D rather than make it, you're not using up 7-dehydrocholesterol to make your vitamin D. Therefore, there's more available to become cholesterol. Plus, there are distinctly different pathways of entry into the body. When you make vitamin D3 in the sun, it's shuttled through your body by vitamin D binding protein. But when you ingest it, it's picked up by the lymphatic system, and it's shuttled by lipoproteins, and this shuttle is LDL cholesterol, the one everyone's worried about. So here you are worried about this LDL cholesterol, but you're forcing your body to shuttle stuff all around with it. And we have no idea if it's all going to make it to the liver, its first journey. And none of those things we do to protect you from calcification can step in in the pickup shuttle system from the gut and protect you. You can't, vitamin K can't act there, boron can't act there. They can't save you there. They can only save you on down the road in the process of building the bone in theory. You know, Jim, you made a comment a little while ago about when you make vitamin D, you what burn up folate. Can can right. you dial, can you dial that back when you when you're saying you make vitamin D? What does that mean? When you are in the UVB influence of two eighty to three hundred twenty nanometer, the the right conditions to cause the creation of the pre D three and the D three. That is also degrading folate in the skin. And that's why people get darker, is to protect that folate. That's why you see it. And the more sun influence, the darker those people are, so that they can protect their folate and not have neural tube defects. And that's not something we need to supplement, right? Because <laughs> I, I get pregnant women asking me all the time, should I take folate? I'm like, no, get it from food. Yeah, get it from food because if they supplement it, I it's really hard to find folate. They're going to find folic acid, which doesn't exist in nature. We tested it in pigs and they were 93% efficient, I think. Then they put it in everything and they finally tested in humans. I think we were 7%, the inverse, efficient in it. And it hogs carriers. It gets to that D2, D3 difference we were talking about. It hogs folate carrier, carriers and receptors with uh, unmetabolized folic acid, UMFA. Um, I studied it a little bit. I know a little bit about it. Well, wow. one, of my, one of my theories, I can't prove this. I have some interesting 
uh, research to kind of pepper the, the theory. But I believe that the B vitamins are all copper dependent. And I believe the B vitamins are all used to regulate iron. And so years ago, I had a conversation with one of my one of my heroes is um, Leslie Clavet. He's a, he's a famous uh, copper researcher. And I asked him about my theory. He said, well, Morley, I can't speak to all of the B vitamins, but I can tell you for a fact that folate B9 is copper dependent. So my mind is racing now to try to figure out what does this mean when we're making vitamin D, it's degrading folate or B9. That's, a, that's going to have an effect on, on copper status because I know that, you know, again, I'm looking at this from a, from a slightly different standpoint, but what, I, but what I also know and recently learned is that when active D is made, you know, in the kidney or, or extra renal tissue, it has a tendency to upregulate the, the synthesis of metallothionine. What does metallothionine do? It binds up copper a thousand times stronger than it binds up zinc. I don't think people realize what the, the there's a very dark side to high vitamin D is it's really affecting copper metabolism. And people need to understand that. And, and one of the questions I, I was going to have for you, Jim, is to what extent does vitamin D, and I'll just use the generic vitamin D, to what extent does vitamin D affect oxygen metabolism in the human body? Do you have any thoughts about that at all? Actually, no, I don't. I've never seen anything on cellular respiration tied to vitamin D levels or being lower pH levels affected in tissues from the vitamin D deficiency they talk about. I haven't run across that. Well, I just, I think it, I, I, there may be a connection because if, if active D is messing up copper and copper's job is to activate oxygen, it's like there's got to be some correlation there. And it doesn't surprise me that it's not in the literature, but I think I, I just share that as a caution to the listeners that that get beyond the the marker is low, and I think they hopefully by now they realize this is a really complicated subject. But there's more to the vitamin D story than high and low. It's it's having a, a significant impact on a lot of different facets of our metabolism, not the least of which is retinol and copper and magnesium and iron and energy. I mean, it's just it has it has its uh, tentacles in a lot of different parts of the metabolism, as as I think we're discussing it. I wish I yeah. knew more about that. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 sure. I'm expecting a summary paper sometime next week. <laughs> <laughs> Homework assignment. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, in my in my dreams. Yeah. <laughs> so, so a lot of names were mentioned too. The Hector De Luca. I think I I just looked on YouTube. He has a lot of lectures. Um, are there good little lectures people can watch or presentations on the the reality of this if people want to like expand or connect the dots further yeah um meg has done some really good presentations she's got a couple google docs um about it that i have on my page and there's a video called goldilocks not a vitamin she made um meg has that paper inflammation the infection connection where she starts talking about the uh all-cause mortality range and you have to be careful because that one's in the non-us numbers so um it looks like they were actually shooting for a much higher goal um whenever you look at the other units of measure of course and she's somebody that helped me early on actually she was with trevor marshall and left him and started the chronic illness recovery network and when i discovered the active form of d for my ex-wife and we got it tested and it was really high. She actually consulted with our doctor in Redmond, Washington and gave me access to her entire electronic library for the chronic illness recovery network. So she's one that helped me really learn what I know about vitamin D early on. And so um, I can, I can make those available. I could send those to you if you wanted and you can make them available. Yeah, in the show notes, I'll put because I'm sure, like Morley said, people's heads are spinning 
<laughs> and their minds blown because this is a lot of information all at once. So just different resources where they can even connect the dots more and maybe listen to this multiple times might help. But uh, I'd say just diversify listening to the right people because most people, I mean, it's they're selling vitamin D supplements. They're sharing, you know, scary memes, like you mentioned, like fear porn, which mm-hmm. is just rampant during this whole COVID scenario where just these infographics that are so dangerous and yeah, uh, yeah just leading people the wrong direction. So. Right. Well, let's talk about the two five D serum goal for just one second and why, why they decided that that's what they want to measure. They, We'll all talk about how 125D is the active form. It's the biologically active one that does the work in papers. You know, they don't necessarily make that clear in articles about it, just like they don't mention the vitamin A. But when you read a paper, you'll find that it is vitamin D, 25D is the best indicator of vitamin D status. You almost verbatim find that language each time given. And Next time you see that, follow the citations and go read them. Because one of the main ones is going to be Michael Hollick, 1990. And when you start reading that, it's going to be a completely different world you're entering. Because he's going to start out with telling you 200 IU is very reasonable. That's right there in that paper that they're citing. So we haven't always said you need insane levels. In fact, everybody always talks about how safe it is by citing Combrio. Com- I, how do you say his name? I'm sorry. The the MS protocol doctor. Com- oh, I, I, I don't know yeah. how to say it. Okay. okay. People don't realize that he only treats people that have a vitamin D resistance. Um, try to find the literature to assess your patient for that, but he's been very clear about that. So you can't hold his dosing up and use it as this is safe. We've seen this is safe. He's treating vitamin D resistant people, much like Ricketts. So that's a different world to be in. So it's just all in context. They changed the goal and really everybody's forgotten that the goal used to be different. Um, Everybody's dabbling in tests and selling vitamin D. They all have their own patented vitamin D. Um, Dr. Canal has endorsed a time release version. So they are all looking at their own end. I have a WebMD open here. And unfortunately, like healthy health line, there's a lot of websites that people just go to because it's comes up on Google. And in this <laughs> vitamin D3 tablet page, it says vitamin D drops or other supplements are given to breastfed infants because breast milk usually has low levels of vitamin D. That's by design, right? (laughs) Exactly. For a reason. There's no iron and no vitamin D for a reason. (laughs) Right. Right. And let's talk about that for a second, because that's interesting. We were just talking about 200 IU is reasonable. So Mm -hmm. 400 IU, I think, is still pretty much the ticket in a lot of supplements and stuff. So it's probably the, the what they're saying is the minimum. So... But if you watch, if you read the breast study, breast milk study, where they gave 400 IU to mothers and they gave 6,400 IU to mothers, 16 times more, they, both groups, the mothers and the breastfeeding infants started out low. They were in the teens, let's say, both groups. Then they took either 400 or 6,400. I don't remember the length of time, but everybody's vitamin D went up. In the mothers that were only doing 400, their babies ended up achieving 43, I believe was the number. Whereas the ones getting 6,400 only made it to 48. So a a difference of five in the end result of your 2,5-D level for taking 16 times more vitamin D. So you have to ask yourself, where did all that other vitamin D go? Did it go out of the body or did it calcify? You really don't know because those results are so close for a 16 factor difference. And there was a recent study in Canada, wasn't placebo controlled, but they had four levels of dosing. The lowest one was 4,000. I think the highest one was 10,000, but the, I'm sorry, 400 was the lowest. That 400 dose group lost bone via that osteoporosis rodenticide we were talking about. Even the lowest ones 
400 IU in the study lost bone. You can't be blaming cofactors when 400 IU is doing damage. You can't avoid that in a normal diet. You're going to get that via fortification forced upon you. And I think what people don't realize is that, you know, as you're describing these two different uh, experiments, that they're not measuring what's happening to magnesium. They're not measuring what's happening to retinol. They're not measuring what's happening to uh, potassium status. You know, the, the, again, um, Ferris, John Ferris at, at Yale talked about renal potassium wasting back in 1962. They're not talking about the iron that gets stored in the kidney because of vitamin D supplements. That's Zagar et al. in 1999. So there's all sorts of variables that are back there that are completely ignored, and they're just zeroing in on the 43 to the 48. I was like, wait a minute, what's the impact to the rest of the body? And I think your question about where is it going and the calcification, those are really important questions for people to, to be thinking about beyond just this simple number that's right here in their face. It's like, that's not enough. If it's, again, because it's a hormone, it's got a lot of power. It's got a lot of impact. I think that, that's got to be something that people really need to understand as they're contemplating this. Right. And hidden in among all that is that we're only looking at the numbers of the inactive form. We yes. have no idea right. what it, what the influence is to the active form. Exactly. That's right. um, so I don't know. I always talk about the flour and bread analogy and stuff. And people are just really focused on the flour level of they're looking at substrates and they don't even realize that you're just getting started with 125D, that active form. That's the goal in that pathway. But what people don't realize in those other pathways, that's a substrate to make a bunch of other molecules too. Most of the literature makes you think it's going to break down to an acid and leave the body then. No, it depends on what tissue that 125D is in then. It has a lot of other options of becoming, there's another level of molecules. That's a that's just a dihydroxy. It can make trihydroxy level analogs. So the, if you wanted to sit down and list analogs of vitamin D, there's there's a bunch of them. I mean, there's at least 60 of them. And <laughs> although 125D has an influence of bone, it's not even the bone builder. That's 24R25D. Nobody's okay. ever heard of that or looked at it or had it measured. But we think that we're dealing with vitamin D. D3, and it's going to take care of all your bone issues. Well, Matt, I don't, I don't want to be a, a party pooper, but I, I'm, I've got a commitment that I've got to get to, but I have a suggestion. I, this has been one of the most illuminating discussions I've ever had, so I'm just I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm wondering if you might want to uh, let your listeners dig into this, let them come up with questions. And then we come back and try to respond to those questions. I think, I hope this conversation has created more uncertainty and more excitement. You know, it isn't that it's to, to create confusion, but it's to create like, wait a minute, this, there's a lot more to this than I realized. I think it's a very important um, salvo into the thinking of your listeners. And hopefully the, it'll, I'd love to see this one go viral. Um, but but I think it's a very important topic that has, I hope, rattled the, the cages of a lot of people in terms of what their understanding is, because I think it's much deeper, much more convoluted than I think anyone ever imagined. That's just my Ab take. Absolutely. Yeah, let's definitely do a round two. Um, I'll, I'll gather up the questions. And I remember, <laughs> I think late last, I think last year there was the vitamin A scare. There was a doctor out there yeah. saying. Sure. Vitamin A toxicity is sounding the alarm, but that's really retinol palmitate or synthetic A. Mm -hmm. And I just find people are kind of pointing their fingers at the wrong things. And so if you want to point your fingers at the right things, how about vitamin D supplements? Because that's now we're actually getting somewhere. <laughs> so, yeah. I agree. yeah. 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 So, so yeah, I really appreciate you guys coming on. Um, you guys are definitely experts in the field of, of minerals, and it's cool to bring together complimentary minds like Morley and Jim, because you guys both have different aspects of the puzzle. So I have a feeling that if we let Jim loose, I think he could, I think you, Jim, I think you could talk for like four or five hours straight 
and you you just be scratching the surface. It's just like I'm like I'm taking notes over here. I'm like trying to keep up. I'm just that just finding fine. out about yeah, just finding out about folate is blowing my mind. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, I'd do that if it makes sense. But that's why let's wait and get the feedback and see how over the boards they say I was because I kind of am. <laughs> they say listening to me no. is like trying to drink from a fire hose. No, this was amazing. This was absolutely amazing. I'm really just delighted to be here. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I'll put the links below. Anything you guys want me to put below the show, send over. And I'll definitely link the Facebook group because I know there's a lot of great resources in there too. Sounds good. <clears throat> awesome. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks so much and stick around as I close out the show. Thanks uh, thanks for coming on, Jim and Morley. That was All a right. lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. you bet. Wow. There are very few episodes where I know that I'm going to have to re-listen to them multiple times. This is definitely one of those. There was so much information from Jim and Morley in this episode that was just mind-blowing. And I thought it was perfect to have these two guys on because the information that they have in their brain is complementary. The Morley has the calcium magnesium and iron piece really down well. And he also knows quite a bit about retinol and he knows about vitamin D, but Jim has really dedicated his time to studying vitamin slash hormone D in depth. So it was really cool to hear them go back and forth about this. And uh, it sounds like Morley had a lot of cool revelations and uh, dots that were connected but isn't that incredible? 12 different forms of 25D and they're sulfated and unsulfated and the epimerization pathway. Really, really interesting that the more I learn about tests for different nutrients, I just see people getting confused because they'll get a test that shows that they're quote unquote low in something. And by the way, who's calling it low, right? You ever ask yourself that question? Who defines low hormone D levels? And what form, again, are they looking at? And people take it and run with it, and they'll start supplementing megadoses of the wrong supplement based upon a lab test. And are they even looking in the right spot? Are they looking at the right form? Most likely, no, for multiple different nutrients. So at this point in my life, I've decided to just throw out all tests as far as blood tests and all of that. I really don't think there's much benefit besides maybe a Dutch test or the full Monty iron panel, but most tests will just get people confused. That's what I've seen a lot of just rabbit hole after rabbit hole and just chasing your tail, taking the wrong things, just trying to fill the gaps that supposedly need to be filled. So this to me is one of the most important episodes I've ever released because a lot of people challenge me on this and say, what are you talking about? You know, even Ray Pete is a big fan of vitamin D supplementation. And as I've said before, nobody has the whole puzzle put together, myself included, for sure. Uh, to me, the only person that has the whole puzzle put together is Jesus Christ. And that really takes the pressure off because people can get stuck in this thing where it's like constantly searching, whether it be for science or for spiritual concepts and like constant searching. And that exhausts the body and the mind and people will eventually hit a brick wall doing that will just fall apart from that constant kind of struggle of, of thinking they could put it all together a hundred percent. That's, that's never going to happen, but we can learn a lot and we can definitely unravel a lot of what we've been taught, especially in the alternative health community, especially with these people on stage sharing their products 
these health quote unquote summits, these seminars online, these webinars that are close to useless and that are sharing really harmful information. So I do my best on Mito Life Radio, and I think this is the reason why it's growing so quickly. We just hit 200,000 unique downloads, and every month we're getting a lot more listens in the show, so it really means a lot. If you share this with your family and friends, this is truly life-saving information, and I'm really honored to have this platform to be able to share this groundbreaking information of people that are on the cutting edge. Morley Robbins is on the cutting edge of alternative health. Same with Jim Stevenson. These people are actually sharing information that could save lives. And all they need is a platform, a podium to speak at. And My Life Radio is perfect for that. We talk about mitochondrial health. We talk about minerals. We talk about just overall health in general and really challenge the conventional dogma that is pushed because people think, oh, I'm out of conventional, I'm safe, right? But there's so many vampires in the alternative health community, supplement makers, liposomal supplement makers that are preying on innocent victims, innocent, ignorant consumers that are hungry for information that is different from the allopathic conventional route. But guess what? They're just as bad, and they're using a lot of the same mechanisms, the same mindset, the same tools as the conventional docs. So you really have to pick and choose where you get your health information from. And I believe this is one of the best health podcasts out there because I just get bored listening to other shows. It's always the same crap. It's this diet, it's the carnivore diet is the heal-all, or it's keto, it's intermittent fasting, That's mo- or it's yoga, right? which is harmful to the body, and I believe the spirit, and all these different things that are just getting people lost. And so this show, My Life Radio, my other favorite podcast is Extreme Health Radio with Justin and Kate. I think they're doing awesome stuff. And they introduced me to a lot of awesome guests like Adam Bergstrom. That's really a wealth of information. So this is a subject that we'll cover more on the show. Uh, Definitely check out the links below that I'll post. Watch the video. Read the PDF. And we'll have a follow-up show, uh, like Morley suggested, where... I'll answer all of your specific questions about vitamin D because this was a very complex, very scientific show where uh, Jim was really just laying it out, you know, holds barred, which is, is awesome. And I'd like to kind of simplify it in the future uh, because that was probably overwhelming and very complex to understand, but it's good. Because people think that vitamin D or hormone D is simple and you supplement it and you're all good, but it's not all good. That's not how it is. It's actually 125 vitamin D that's the important one. And according to Jim, pretty much nobody's low in that. It's very, very rare. So anyways, that's it for the show. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Check out... Uh, Secosteroid Hormone D on Facebook. So many resources there. I mean, you could just spend hours and days and weeks looking into vitamin D and why you don't want to supplement it and just get it from the sun. And I think raw dairy is the best source. And Morley Robbins, of course, I always point people to our first interview, Why Minerals Run the Show. And... He went really deep into iron in that episode. So many people are still confused about iron deficiency anemia, which is a misdiagnosis. And he really broke it down there. And I've had him on since, I think, four extra times. So this is the, I believe, sixth time I've had Morley on the show. Uh, He's really awesome and just an encyclopedia of knowledge and wisdom. 
So thanks so much for listening. Uh, if you want to support the show, you can go to matt-blackburn.com. I have my blog because I need to start writing more of those. I've been so busy with the homestead and it's a lot of work setting up uh, milking station for goats and uh, setting up the chickens. That's what I've been working on for the last month and it's finally done. But it's always ongoing. There's always little things to do with the heat that always brings flies. And so I recently found these uh, fly predators you can buy online and they're little insects that actually prevent the fly larvae from hatching. So that's pretty cool. So it actually reduces the amount of flies born by the thousands. Um, so I've kind of been <laughs> doing fly research. I also got some solar fly traps because those fly bags work, but I almost threw up, you know, cleaning that out or taking it off. So these solar fly traps, they actually dehydrate the fly after it's killed with the sun. And so there's no smell and it just brings them into a bait thing into a little uh, screen that they can't fly out of and uh, cooks them, dehydrates their little bodies. So that's pretty cool. Uh, lots of stuff to learn. <laughs> homesteading it's really fun though but uh challenging to, to keep up with all this stuff that's why i'm really glad i have the podcast because people like morley and jim keep me up to date with all this info uh want to make an announcement that uh troscriptions they have the best methylene blue product out there uh, they just came back in stock with their just blue which doesn't have nicotine hemp or caffeine in it a lot of people don't like that it just has methylene blue in the lozenge. And each one is four milligrams each dose and up to four a day to get to 16 milligrams, which is the safe dose that has been shown in the research. And uh, Georgie Dinkoff on my show has gone into methylene blue in the past. Uh, this is something that is uh, really powerful for a lot of different things. Uh, there's studies on uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, there's studies on its antiviral properties, uh, especially in combination with uh, visible light. Could be red light, could be sunlight. Uh, energy production, neuroprotection, memory enhancement, uh, memory retention, um, all sorts of stuff. Even actually optimizing uh, ATP production. It's also my understanding that it lowers serotonin, which is not the feel-good hormone, but a stress hormone. Uh, because on the transcriptions website it says don't take it with SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SNRIs, or monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, so that's pretty cool. That's a huge side benefit because we know that high serotonin is linked with uh, not only becoming a psychopath, but also uh, any kind of eye disease or eye problems or macular degeneration or myopia and uh, gut issues. Uh, serotonin really synergizes with a lot of things, uh, estrogen, PUFAs, endotoxin, and can really cause a lot of damage systemically. So if you go to troscriptions.com and click products, um, just blue will pop up and it's 27 bucks for four, but that's actually 16 doses because there's four per dose. And if you use the discount code Blackburn, you actually save 10%. So you can save a little bit there. And I prefer the Just Blue. It feels a little bit cleaner. And it's a really easy way to take methylene blue. And I believe it's higher grade than getting fish tank cleaner, which is technically what it is. But uh, they have a better source. So I would go with theirs. And also mitolife.co. Um, if you've been waiting on the vitamin E, just want to make another announcement that I've been having website issues <laughs> with uh, the restock notices. I uh, had a little glitch or a bug. So I added a feature to the site where if you put in your email, you'll get notified when it's back in stock. But I'll sometimes get returns from customers. And that actually triggered an email to send to hundreds of people. And so if you were one of those... Uh, Sorry, <laughs> I'm working hard to get it back in stock. The corona madness has really slowed down everything. 
but the wait will be worth it, I promise. I'm upgrading the formula to be even more powerful against lipid peroxidation, which is its whole purpose. It's called PUFA Protect, and it will be uh, actually less pills that you have to take because they'll be bigger. So it'll be more vitamin E per pill, so you have to take less, which I think people like. So thanks so much for uh, supporting me and my work by buying uh, my life products. It really means a lot. Um, the Purely K people are really loving and the probiotic and endotoxin reducer. Those are two of my uh, newest products. And the Panacea, I'm actually working on a, a YouTube video I'm going to put out all about the Shilajit tablets and how and why and when and all of that take it a lot of confusion about shilajit i really liked what jeff lawton said in the npk episode he was talking about carbon he wasn't talking about shilajit but carbon is a sponge carbon is nature's sponge and shilajit is a natural source of carbon it's it's a concentrated source of carbon so it's different from activated charcoal, which is what's found in your water filter. You wouldn't break apart your water filter and eat it, would you? So why would you take activated charcoal? That's where I'm coming from. Shilajit is a natural source of carbon, of really condensed, high-dose carbon. So you're taking a huge sponge into your body that's going to grab onto... Well, scientifically, we could say all monovalent and divalent atoms and chelate and complex them with the fulvic acid. It's just a perfect package to not only provide minerals to the body, but to mineral balance with unbound copper and excess iron, which Shilajit does chelate. So that's it. Um, I think that's all the announcements. Uh, if you use the discount code first time on any of the MitoLife products, you'll save 15%. And uh, thanks for your patience. If I don't get back to your emails, your messages, um, I do my best. I just get uh, slammed with messages. So I'm trying to do more uh, Q&As and uh, interviews where I can answer your questions. And maybe just doing a, a weekly uh, Q&A would, would help. Uh, regularly scheduled where people can tune in. Also want to say uh, Morley Robbins can be found at the root cause protocol.com and you'll find his recommendations there. He has some great uh, videos on magnesium and iron and resources there and anyone dealing with uh, iron issues uh, can really, I would say save their life uh, by finding Morley Robbins' work and applying it to their life. I uh, really appreciate uh, what Morley has uh, brought to the, the health community in the world. I think he, he's really uh, saving lives with what he's doing. And the same with Jim Stevenson. So thanks so much for listening. Uh, again, please share the show with your friends and family. Post it in Facebook groups. Uh, send episodes to who you think can benefit from it and let's uh, continue learning together today's quote is by stephanie jasky how can vitamin d3 supplements be bad for you the truth is they can kill they eventually destroy your kidneys veterinarians know very well how cholecalciferol d3 kills pets and other small animals because they see it quite often when the family pet accidentally ingest decon or similar poison meant for rats. Conversely to veterinary medicine, the human medical community would like you to believe that D3 rat poison is completely safe to consume because the cholecalciferol and rat poisons are, quote, much stronger, unquote, than the small amounts given to humans for health, or that mice are different from humans and therefore the same effects cannot be applied to humans. Of course, this doesn't quite jive with the fact that mice and rats are the most commonly used test subjects for human medical trials. While the fact is, the mechanism by which cholecalciferol works on rats is precisely the same in humans. This is not a case of dogs and chocolate. 
polycalciferol raises serum calcium either acutely or chronically and damages the kidneys. How quickly or slowly really doesn't make kidney damage more palatable. Any kidney damage is too much. And no, taking vitamin K2 will not stop this damage from occurring. In fact, the doses of this synthetically industrialized manufactured oil-based chemical designed for rat bait are very similar in scale to the amounts now being given to humans for supplementation. And make no mistake, it is the exact same chemical. As you'll see in one link below, cal cal calciferol manufactured for both rat poison and human supplements are even made by the same manufacturing company in the same facility. D3 slash cholecalciferol kills rats within minutes to hours by destroying the kidneys and shutting them down. It damages humans within weeks to months to possibly years by first creating a chronic elevation in serum calcium, which your body then attempts to rectify, thereby creating renal kidney potassium wasting, which then progresses to hypercalcemia and if ingestion is continued, it inevitably results in kidney failure, just like in rats. It is all poison, regardless of the length of time it takes to work. Just how much poison do you think is healthy to have in your diet?